Sometimes I feel the weight of the world fall down on me so heavy. And I need a friendly voice with some good theology. Calvinistically speaking, though I mix a manly drink, Pepsi and shoe polish. And I hit the YouTube link. Don't say hit, that sounds violent. And I feel my troubles all melt away. Oh, ho! Your Calvinist podcast is filmed before a live studio audience. And hey, everybody, welcome to Your Calvinist podcast. My name is Keith Foskey, and as always, I am Your Calvinist, and I'm glad to have you here on the show, and I'm super excited to welcome my guest. But before I do, just have a few things I want to remind you. One, this podcast is a ministry of Sovereign Grace Family Church. So if you're in the Jacksonville area, come visit us at Sovereign Grace Family Church. You can find us at SGFC Jacks. Org. Also, we are a member of the Truth and Love Network, and in a week and a half, I'm going to be with the guys in the network doing our conference in Knoxville. It's a free conference, so if you're in the Knoxville area, come and visit us. You can find it at Truth and Love Network. Just Google that, and you'll find out all about it. We're also sponsoring 1689 Cigars, and 1689 Cigars is offering a uh, discount for anyone who wants to go and get great cigars, and you use the discount code Superior Theology and you'll be able to get a discount on some great cigars. Finally, go to KeithFosky.com if you want to reach me. You can get anything you need, my videos, uh, contact information, all that stuff, even a link to buy cool stuff like this shirt I'm wearing, which actually says Superior Theology, and you can get it from our Teespring store just by going to KeithFosky.com and looking for that link. Well, guys, I'm super excited to welcome my guest today. This is a man who probably needs very little introduction for most of you, especially in the reform world, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. This is Dr. Professor and my new friend, R. Scott Clark. R. Scott Clark is a professor of history and historical theology. He has taught at Wheaton Reform Theological Seminary, Westminster Seminary, California, as well as some other schools. There are really too many to list. I saw on <laughs> today, he's, I was looking through his bio. He's an author. He's also a minister with the United Reformed Church in North America, and he's been a minister since 1998. He is a writer for the Heidel blog. He does the uh, podcast of that. Uh, I forget the name of the podcast, but I think it's it just, just it's the Heidel something podcast. He's going to tell us in a moment. For the podcast. There it is. <laughs> My bad. Yeah. And his wife doesn't listen to anything he does. So that. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Dr. Clark, we were talking about that right beforehand, how uh, it's hard sometimes to get our wives to listen to our podcast and stuff. But thank you for being on the show today, my friend. Well, I'm happy to be here. And I, I absolutely loved the intro to the podcast. That was outstanding. Uh, he's not like other Calvinists. He's nice. <laughs> that right. was great. That's that's. Very funny. You made me laugh out loud. So I was on mute, so nobody heard it. But I was laughing out loud, which I guess makes it official laughing. Yes. And I'm I'm glad it's what's funny is that that song was produced, written and performed by uh, Hans Feeney, a Lutheran. Oh, so yeah, he, that's he, great. He, <laughs> he, he I think he really he really nailed it. So I, I keep he, having he's to thank multi talented. Him for Yes, he is. And he did all the music. He played the guitar. His wife's in the background singing. So his, it's a whole talented, talented family. Nice. Well, I want to tell the story of what brought us together today. Uh, this all this all came about because of a tweet. Someone on Twitter posted a tweet that said, I hate all the bantering that happens on podcasts. I wish they would just get to the point. And then you responded with something like, I like the bantering. I think it's fun or something to that effect. And I responded and said, anytime you want to come on my show, we can banter for an hour about whatever you want to talk about. And immediately you can, <laughs> you and I got connected and I was super excited. I actually told my wife, I said, listen, 
our Scott Clark and I are going to have a conversation and, and she's like, okay, that sounds cool. And I was like, it's really important for me. Trust me. This is, this is, <laughs> this is really, that says it's, it's something like, about your like, life that, uh, cause this yeah. should not be that important though. Oh, but anyway, I'm, I'm well, honored to be here. I've, I've enjoyed your videos very much. You've made me laugh uh, lots of times. I, I, I have no idea how many times people have sent me the videos and said, Oh, you have to see this. This guy's fantastic. And, and of course he is. So, Oh, well, I, I appreciate that very much. And I'm thankful that God has used a little bit of humor to allow me to connect with people. And again, I I told you this before the show, but I have read some of your stuff and I've been very blessed by it. And I want to say just thank you right offhand uh, or right before we get into everything and everything we're going to talk about today. We may disagree on a few things, but ultimately I appreciate you as a brother in Christ, as a teacher in, in God's church and in, and in his seminaries. And so um, if there is any disagreement, it's going to be brotherly and in a way that is that oh, is yeah. fun. And hopefully, you know, just like just like I do with everybody, I, I hope to uh, to to show you all the respect in the world, because I do respect you and, and appreciate all that you've done. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And that's that's how I feel. And if, can I correct you on one small factual thing? I was actually sure. I'm 10 years older than you made me. I was I was actually ordained in 88, but I transferred into the URCs in 98. So I'm I'm an old pastor. Oh, okay. And uh, so I've been trying in one way or another to shepherd God's uh, people for a long time. So I was in Kansas City as an associate pastor for a couple of years, then a solo pastor for four years. And then in the providence of God, mysteriously, I ended up in uh, academia. So I've been at Westminster since so I've been at Westminster since 97. Anyway, so that's so that that, and training that might be, a, and that's awesome. And that might be like the first thing we could spin off on real quick because yeah. I think that's a very valuable thing that you have. You've actually been in the trenches. You've been in churches. You've been a pastor prior to being a professor. I know some guys go straight from 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 mm -hmm. being students to being teachers, and they don't have that in the in the uh, trenches. You know, yeah. what would you say was the most valuable thing you learned? while pastoring that you've carried into being a professor? Oh, man. Um, boy, that's a great question. I, I, you know, I think two things changed my preaching, um, uh, or three. One, learning, you know, as a young preacher, you, you want to do too much in every sermon. And you, you have to think of ministry more like a baseball game. And, um, you, you know, you were going to be up again, you have time, you don't have to do it all now. And you learn to simplify and, and clarify. And, and so when we had kids, that really changed my preaching. Um, uh, you know, being in a congregation and, and developing a relationship with them and, you know, them coming to regard me as their under shepherd and, and I coming to regard them as God's flock, you know, that really changes the way, you know, I preached. Um, and then I think, as I say, having kids really taught me something about communication. Um, as a young preacher, you think, well, I've said that, and now they've heard it, and I can go on and do other things. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. With children, you know, having children, you learn, no, you have to say a thing uh, probably a hundred times before it starts to, certainly you have to say it three times before it starts to, you know, penetrate people's consciousness, and, uh, and probably a lot more than that. I'd say the other thing that really transformed my preaching uh, because uh, was um, a little talk that Mike Horton gave in 1998. We had a, a preaching conference, which if we did it today would probably be a big deal. We had Jay Adams, uh, Tim Keller, Mike Horton, Bob Godfrey, and I don't mean to leave people out. Um, we had a whole bunch of notable people all at one time talking about preaching one day or so in uh, at the seminary in fact we didn't back then we didn't even have a, a chapel in which to do this we did it in the the student lunch room is where we did it and uh, everybody got 20 minutes and uh, mike got up and gave a 20 minute talk on distinguishing law and gospel in preaching absolutely revolutionized my preaching for 10 years I, I i knew there was something wrong with my preaching and i i would tell barbara there's something wrong and she she would say you mean just one thing <laughs> and <laughs> so i couldn't figure it out in fact it was so troublesome that i asked the elders if i could not preach in the evening and if we could turn that into a bible study and i've 
Now, those were good Bible studies, and we learned, and, and I benefited, and they benefited, but it wasn't the preaching of the Word, and it wasn't what we say is the due use of ordinary means. You know, the way that God operates is through the preached Word to bring His elect to new life and true faith. Uh, so I regret doing that very much, but uh, it, it was a symptom or an indicator of, of, of the fact that I knew something was wrong. And when I heard Mark or, or Mike Horton give that talk 10 years into my ministry, I realized, you know, in the course of that talk, this is what's been uh, affecting my preaching for 10 years. I didn't know how to distinguish law from gospel. And so I would preach the gospel. I remember preaching through Exodus and preaching the gospel. You know, you have these wonderful episodes in, in Exodus where you can um, explain the gospel, and, and it's wonderfully illustrated. God sovereignly saving his people out of Egypt and all of that. But then at the end of the sermon, I thought, well, I have to apply it. But I didn't know what I was doing, and I would I ended up putting them back under the covenant of works, and 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 so because I wasn't distinguishing the law as do this and live from the gospel, which is Christ has done, and then preaching the text in light of that distinction. Um, so I was a practical legalist, and I didn't want to be, and I didn't know that I was, and I didn't know how to fix it. Um, so that, I'd say that was the maybe the biggest turning point, because that revolutionized my preaching. Then I knew what, what I'm doing. I'm, I know how I'm looking at the Scriptures and what questions, really what questions I'm asking. How do law and gospel relate in this passage? Which is a, a fundamental Reformation question that, for whatever reason, I had not learned yet to ask. Wow. That's that's it's funny because when I, I I did put out a poll I said what are some of the things you guys would want us to banter about and several people said the law gospel distinction so obviously this has affected you in such a way that that's sort of become connected to you and and your teaching I mean you've written on this obviously you've you've talked about it and, and people have heard this if you were to give like to me you know I'm I'm I've been 18 years in the same church. I've, I've only pastored one church. I actually pastored mm -hmm. the church I grew up in. It's a long, long oh, story. Wow. I've, I've never been a member of another church. Um, Appar even apparently, it's a, a different prophet church can have. Apparently, a prophet <laughs> can have honor in his hometown. So, I'm, yeah, go on. I'm sorry. It, no, no, no. I, that that was my life verse for a while because the first few years were really <laughs> tough. Um, but God, <laughs> God kept. Yeah, God kept me through a lot of uh, difficult times, and even to see our church reform, uh, from being, we were, we were, we, our church, I grew up, it was part of the disciples of Christ. I mm. mean, it was far afield, like very mm. left leaning theologically don't, it was socially conservative, theologically liberal. Mm. And, um, but God saved us out of that and, and is, is still reforming us. I mean, he's still moving, uh, in our midst and I'm, I'm thankful for that. But the thing that I was thinking about, as you were saying that as, you know, as I preach and I still want to be a better preacher, if you were going to give me a just a short explanation of what you mean when you say the law gospel distinction. And I know we could do a whole hour on this and I'm not, I certainly don't want to do the whole thing on that. But if you were going to say to somebody like me or anyone, you know, this is what I mean when I say that, this is what I'm saying yeah. your preaching should look like. How, how would you do that? Well, what Martin Luther discovered as he became a Protestant in the years between 1513 and 1521 is that uh, Augustine had hinted at this in a, in a volume on the Spirit and the Letter. He hadn't laid it out, but he had made a categorical distinction uh, in, in the early 5th century between the law as one kind of speech and the gospel as a qualitatively different kind of speech. And, um, you know, as I say, he didn't elaborate, and he didn't have the same categories that Luther would have in the early 16th century. And so, uh, but Luther was reading Augustine, and he read the, on the Spirit and the letter at some point. Um, later on, he said he was delighted to see that Augustine had seen, in his view, essentially the same thing that he had come to discover. And so, by certainly by 1525, when he wrote on the bondage of the will, uh, he had learned that uh, you know, when Scripture says, for example, uh, you know, do this and live, that's law. So when Jesus said to the rich young man, do this and live, he wasn't saying, now go and do this. He was saying, um, you don't know the greatness of your sin and misery, and I'm going to teach you the greatness of your sin and misery. I'm going to make a demand of you that I know that you can't do. And that's the first use of the law, the pedagogical use of the law. And that's the, the word from God whereby we learn 
uh, of our need of a savior and our inability to save ourselves. And we say that God uses that to, to drive people to Christ. So that's the first use of the law. Then there's the civil use of the law, which, you know, we get into that. Uh, um, you know, what, what's the function of the moral law in, in civil life? Fundamentally to restrain evil. And then the third use of the law is the use of the law as the norm of the Christian life. So, uh, but the law always remains law. The law always says do, right? The law is a cop, a relentless cop who, uh, you know, never gives you a break. Um, and, he, and, he can't, and he doesn't help you to obey. He just demands, he just prosecutes, he just insists. And uh, w- once you understand what the law is and the limits of the law, now you're in a position to understand the gospel, which is a different kind of a word, a qualitatively different word. Now, they're both God's word, and they're all, and law and gospel is all throughout the Holy Scriptures, but the the gospel word is good news. And the good news is Christ came, Christ obeyed uh, for sinners, um, Christ suffered for sinners, so he actively suffered all of his life. He was put to death, he was buried, he was raised on the third day, and, um, you know, he, he uh, has, has ascended, um, and um, 40 days later, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's coming again. That's the gospel. That's good news. And that's a different kind of word than do this and live. So you're always, uh, when you're reading Scripture, especially, you know, as William Perkins says, you can't preach any passage until you know how it relates to law and gospel. Uh, Theodore Beza said uh, the biggest problem plaguing Christianity right now, he said, is uh, the inability or refusal of people to distinguish between law and gospel. Martin Luther said uh, the ability to distinguish law and gospel uh, makes you a theologian. Uh, It's what distinguishes us from the uh, uh, Muslims and the Jews, right? Uh, Because we we have gospel, we have good news. And so, so when you're working on a sermon, you're asking, you know, what's the bad news here? What's the good news here? Or, or at least how do those two principles relate? And um, the thing that makes a sermon distinctively Christian is, is the proclam- proclamation of the good news. R.B. Kuyper used to say that uh, men, if, um, if a, a Muslim or a Jew could preach your sermon, it was not a Christian sermon, right? It, it, it's not mm. distinctively Christian. Because anybody can figure, Paul says that uh, the pagans can figure out the law. Everyone knows, he says in Romans 1 and Romans 2, they know the basic the basics of the law in their conscience. And, and arguably in Colossians, he calls the, uh, you know, these elemental principles, probably has not anything to do with physics. He's talking about the natural knowledge of the law that everyone has. So you, you really don't even need to be a Christian to know what the law is. But you need to be a Christian to appreciate fully uh, what the gospel is, right? The, the law doesn't bring you to Christ or it doesn't make you a Christian. The, the gospel makes you a Christian. That's the thing that we say, for example, uh, by which the Spirit ordinarily brings His elect to new life and true faith is the proclamation of that message of good news. Amen. Amen. Very good. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And um, because we are bantering, I'm going yeah. to move to another topic. But I, I mean, again, we could talk about that all night. I, in fact, 30 questions came to my mind while you were talking. <laughs> and I was like, well, I have other things I want to talk about, but I, maybe I'm here. you'd be so kind as you know, to, come, to come again and we could <laughs> sure. nail down a few of these things. Um, you mentioned something, though. You mentioned that, um, and this is, again, this is a different topic, but on the same idea. You mentioned that when you listen to Dr. Horton, uh, he, he was, um, it was a 20 minute message. Recently I heard, or I recently I saw a person write this, um, he he wrote a a post saying that you, you know, a sermon that's only 20 minutes or 25 minutes is not a real sermon. It's gotta be longer. It's gotta be deeper (laughs) when you were preaching. Cause you mentioned about communicating with your kids. Right. And you mentioned about communication. What was, what, what, do you think that's true? Do you think a, a, a thirty-minute sermon is not enough, or a twenty-five-minute sermon is? What, what are your thoughts about that? Because do, do you think that's an ar- arbitrary thing that we sort of place on people, or because I, I preach long, but but I I don't you know I don't I don't condemn people who don't you know. 
I, you know, I was once invited to candidate for a congregation, but one of their unbending rules was a sermon could be no longer than 20 minutes. And I knew immediately <laughs> this call was not for me. I've had, I've done introductions to sermons that were 20 minutes. So I'm sorry, there's no way. I mean, I could work on a sermon all week and I couldn't get it down to, to 20 minutes. So I just knew that was impossible. I mean, now our pastor, uh, Chris Gordon, who's a voice of abounding grace radio he 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 will go 45 minutes easily he's been known to go 50 minutes now it's great stuff and i'm happy to listen to it uh, because he's such a fine preacher uh, i try to stick to 30 minutes you know right around there 32 33 minutes somewhere in there i have an internal clock that starts going off at about 29 minutes wrap it up idiot you've not you're not saying anything <laughs> it's all that spectacular so um just quit while you're ahead is kind of what goes off in my head um so yeah you know I, I once was challenged by a parishioner to to preach a short sermon and i you know she didn't think i could do it i think i preached 23 minutes i've done it once since 1987 when i actually started preaching in 88 since i was ordained um i don't you know it, it's all about circumstances uh, what the congregation can tolerate, um, what's useful, what's edifying. Even the Westminster Divines warned preachers not to weary people. And, you know, it was mm. common in the 16th century to speak for an hour. It was sort of expected that you'd preach for an hour. People would be a little disappointed if you didn't preach for an hour. And um, by the way, that's how they got through the Heidelberg Catechism in uh, in 52 Sundays was you had— uh, uh, you you had sixty minutes to do each Lord's Day. Uh, Bob Godfrey has you know gets yeah. after us for not getting all the way through the Catechism. Well, it's a little harder when you have thirty minutes. Uh, you could get because we do uh, <laughs> Catechism sermons in the evening. You see, and you have like three oh, questions okay. for each each Lord's Day. Um, so a little challenging, but uh, um, at any rate, um, uh, yeah. That so that's. Uh, yeah, I mean, somebody says a twenty-minute sermon. That's not a sermon. Well, I'd say go listen to uh, uh, my friend Eric Landry, uh, who actually uh, took that call, right? And he preaches those twenty-minute sermons, and those are fine sermons, right? He can do that. Yeah. He, God's gifted him with that. So um, I can't see making. It, I, I agree with you. You use the word arbitrary. I think that's a good word. Yeah. Well, let's get to the fun one. I know this is going to be fun. I know this is what people have been waiting on. Uh, this was the most most asked question, yeah. and uh, I'm going to pre I'm going to preface this by saying, um, "Why do you hate Reformed Baptists?" No, I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so exactly the 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 question I want to ask is, "What's your history with this?" Because I, I have heard. Um, I did. I did a. I did a interview with several Presbyterian um, pastors. And um, when we were on there, I asked them the question about, do you think a Baptist can be reformed? And they were sort of like, well, you know, kind of. And then one of the guys even said, well, I'm not our Scott Clark. So, <laughs> so, and he was just kidding. But yeah. he was, you know, so it was apparent to me that, okay, uh, uh, you must have been pretty vocal about that question if, if that's if that's the you know if that's sort of the bantering joke right like i'm not r scott clark yeah, yeah. well what what got your goat on that question what makes you more outspoken than others and 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 how long has that been happening how long has that been going on yeah that's an interesting question i i never had so when i started in ministry this really wasn't an issue and um, mm -hmm. it only became one really with the rise of the young restless and, re and reform movement. So there was a small contingent of people who called themselves reform Baptists, and it, you know wasn't that much of an issue. I didn't even think about it, you know, frankly, uh, until I got here in '97. Uh, we had the Institute for Reform Baptist Studies that we, we hosted them, and um, you know Jim Renahan ran the uh, seminary and and. Um, he was great. You know, he's a colleague. Uh, I remember spending a couple of hours when I first got here with, with Jim and Earl Blackburn and uh, really, you know, I, I uh, have a lot of affection uh, for them. Or I, talk, I, I don't talk to Jim as much, just out of, not for any reason in particular, you know, Earl Blackburn and I talk occasionally. 
Um, he's a wonderful guy. He gave me, I once said, Earl, I love that tie. He took it off and gave it to me right then. I wasn't asking for it. Aww. That's just the kind of guy he is. He's just a very sweet guy. So I, I love teaching Baptist students over the years, but having the students around uh, sort of forced me to sharpen my thinking and to read and research and learn and, uh, you know, over the years. And then I, I, I wrote a book called Recovering the Reformed Confession, and I was working on that and just finishing it when Young Restless, you know, Colin Hansen's Young Restless and Reformed came out, and I wrote a little epilogue. I, I, I Obviously, I couldn't address the book because mine was done, and so I just did a little epilogue saying there's more to being Reformed than predestination. But what the in the course of writing that book, I, I realized that for a lot of people, the operative definition of Reformed was now no longer, you know, the kinds of things you find in the Heidelberg Catechism, wherever, there we go, uh, there we go, <laughs> right? The kind of things you find in the Heidelberg Catechism, it's just predestination. Well, that's a terrible definition of Reformed. We confess an awful lot more than that. You know, we have a, a doctrine of God, a doctrine of man, um, you know, we have a doctrine of salvation and um, doctrine of scripture and, and, you know, and church and sacraments. All these are part of what we are. And I thought we're making a terrible deal. And in fact, what I concluded was in the 1950s, uh, you know, a, a group of guys sort of, you know, you might call them neo-Puritan guys um, kind of cut a deal. And um and I th and the deal was we'll call you reformed if you'll call us Christians, and um, you know we we were small, uh, struggling, you know, in the post World War II uh, era, uh, the conservative Presbyterian and Reformed churches had not fared very well. You know, uh, we lost our we lost our buildings, uh, we lost our institutions. Uh, we were in the wilderness. Our schools were small, and so there was this sort of implicit deal that was made. And um, now, as you get into the 1990s, with the rise of the Young Restless and Reform movement, and right around 2000, if you search Google Ngram as I have, you'll see there's a real spike in the usage of this phrase, Reform Baptist, and it, it didn't really even exist. The earliest usage I found so far, and I didn't find it, somebody sent it to me, is in a North Carolina newspaper from 1983. There's no context. I can't tell what it means. You can find it being used in the 19th century. I've looked at a lot of the uses, and um, none of them really refer to an ecclesiastical body. It's just Reformed and Baptist in, in conjunction. But you'd start to see that expression spiking in the late 90s and right around 2000. And that's, again, to do with the Young Wrestlers and Reform movement and all of that. So that's how I got involved in this. I, I, I wanted to say, no, I'm sorry, you know, you can't say, for example, in the Belgian Confession, you know, we uh, use the language of detestable, uh, we detest the, the Anabaptist error, we say. And what is it? It's the rejection of infant baptism. Well, how can people who hold what we say is a detestable error be reformed, and yet uh, we, the reformed, confess th that very thing. How can that be? It doesn't make any sense. So I, so I started asking my Baptist friends, well, can I be a Baptist? And they said, no. Well, why not? <laughs> I baptize uh, adult converts who are hitherto unbaptized. Yeah, but you're not a Baptist. Okay, so you're a stickler when it comes to defining Baptist, but when it comes to defining Reformed, you are in effect saying to me, well, there's more of us than there are of you. We've redefined it. Get over it. And that's effectively an argument from force. It's not a coherent argument. So this is as much about what we are as it is what you are. Um, if, we, if we concede this definition, we will come to regret it very much because we will have bought a, a, gr a greatly um, reduced definition of what it is to be reformed. And um, I don't want to give that up. I think that's a precious heritage. I think words mean something, and um, this word has meant something since the 15, well, 1540s and 50s, to be sure, right? It was a little fuzzy in the 20s who was Reformed. It got used pretty loosely of the Zwinglians and, and the Lutherans. But by the 1540s and 50s, you know, it's pretty clear who's Reformed and who's Lutheran and so forth and who's Anabaptist. So I don't know why we would give this up. And uh, so that's what this is about. It's not personal. It's a matter of principle. And, and um, I, 
I'm not entirely sure why people get so um, irritated. My and particularly Baptist folks are very, very. Some of them are very unhappy with me. Somebody used the word nasty. Uh, you saw that in the, you know on Twitter, and I get that all the time. Um, and I don't think that I don't think of it that way at all. And I'm I'm sorry if people's feelings are hurt, but facts matter. History matters. Objective reality matters. And I've been I've even pointed out there's a certain amount of identity politics going on here. People are saying, well, I identify as reformed. Um, that's not going very well, right? Um, you're seeing how this goes. And I, I don't think that's that wouldn't be good for Baptists. I mean, Baptists have their own identity. They have their own history. Um, and they have their own language. In the early 17th or in the um, 17, early 1740s, when the a particular Baptist movement emerged out of Anglicanism, out of uh, some of the congregational churches. They called themselves, right? They, there were two kinds of Baptists, general Baptists and particular Baptists. That has to do with the atonement. And uh, they didn't call themselves Reformed. Um, so that's a, re that's a, a relatively new thing. It's a, it's a very new thing as far as I know. So I'm just trying to get people to um, recognize historical reality, objective reality, facts, those kinds of things. Yeah, and and I want to say, and this this is not going to win me any friends on my side. I would say I agree with almost everything you just said, um, especially this thing. I I made this note very recently to a friend. I said the term Reformed Baptist is a new term, and the fact that you've yeah. actually researched it proves what I said was uh, what 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 because this this is my hypothesis, and it's based on things that I have heard and seen is. As Calvinism left the Baptist movement in the, yeah. in the in the early part of the 20th century, and then it was beginning to be rediscovered during the mid and later part of the 20th century, the people who were rediscovering, hey, we have a Calvinistic heritage in our Baptist theology, wanted to find a home because they weren't finding a home in the SBC, yeah. they weren't finding a home in so many places. And so it seems to me like many of those people began to look for homes in other places. That, and as you said, they went to RTS and they went to other seminaries and they, and they went and got educated in Reformed theology, but they knew they didn't want to baptize babies. They wanted to remain Baptists, but they wanted to hold on to some kind of identity as Calvinistic Baptists. And so the, I think the term Reformed Baptist is birthed out of that. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but I mean, even men like Sam Waldron and stuff talk about, you know, going to the seminaries and, and learning the reformed theology and then coming out and, 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 and like you said, Jim Renahan and others, this term, this term reformed Baptist is a relatively new term in the, yeah. in the ecclesiastical lexicon, right. Of, of, of I, I churches, think that's right. you know, no, I, I think your and explanation so, is very good. I think that's right. This is about a need for uh, on the, a need on the part of Baptists to find a home and then so they've invaded mine, and then they resent me for some of them. <laughs> resent me for you well, know, calling the cops on the squatters is what. So I get this. Well, where are we going to go? And my response is, well, in a way, that's not my problem. I, I feel for you. I'll I'll put up a tent, but you can't have my house. <laughs> is what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, and I love my so, Baptist friends, so and I feel their pain. I mean. In fact, I want to. My next project is to take back the word Calvinist, just so you know. I'm, 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 I'm gonna. Well, right. I, I'm gonna hold on to that one because I've got a lot invested in <laughs> advertising. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's part of it too. No, some of this is about marketing, um, right? Some of yeah. this is, and and so now you have these large, relatively large groups within the SBC, or and sort of orbiting around the SBC, um, you know, because. From a reform point of view, the SBC is very complicated because it's it's a denomination, but it's kind of a collection of associations, and you've got people who are SBC, and then, and then at one time they were ARBCA, and simultaneously, and anyway, um, anyway, it's complicated for us. But um, I get that, and and I do. I feel uh, for my friends who are who feel somewhat homeless. Uh, I get that sense too, and I often tell my students, you know. Uh, one of my jobs as a historian is to try to make them feel as uncomfortable with late modern life as I do and as miserable as I am mm. sometimes. So I get that. Yeah. I feel your pain. Well, I, I do. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, like, like you know, I, I, I would say a man like James Pettigrew Boyce, you know, the the yeah. in his in his abstract of systematic theology, I would say that probably would explain a lot of how I understand the scriptures and how I understand theology from, you know, from, from his time period, I think he did a very good job of, of, of laying it out. And, 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 and I, and, and in that, when people say, well, how do you identify? I say, first, I identify as a Baptist. I, I'm not Southern yeah. Baptist in the sense, because we've, we've never been a part of the Southern Baptist convention, but I'm first a Baptist, but I'm also, I believe in the five points of Calvinism. I, I believe I can hold to those five points and still be a yeah. Baptist. And therefore, I do identify myself as a Calvinistic Baptist. Some people don't like the term Calvinist, but I just say in that sense, if we're limiting it, and I know the five points of Calvinism, even that's less than 100 years old as far as a, as, as the way we describe the, the tulip yeah, as exactly, it is today. Yeah. Um, um, but it's still, it has a meaning. But I don't get offended. I, I, and again, I, like I said, I'm not winning any friends on my side. I don't get offended when somebody says you can't be reformed. I say, I don't care. I'm a Baptist and yeah. I believe in the five points of Calvinism. But I'm also, um, and this is going to bring us into another conversation. I, I would also say, though, that there is a there is a stream of covenant theology that is... Um, that, that is baptistic. I don't, I don't even hold to it. I would, and you're going to, you're probably going to write me off when I tell you where I'm at on that. I, I would, I would be closer to like a Wellam and Gentry, um, kingdom through covenant, progressive covenantalism view. And again, don't, 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 don't turn your camera off and walk away. No, I know that, you. no that's okay. Cause it's only going to be a matter of time. Cause that's kind of a halfway house. So you, it's not a tenable long-term I, I, position and there, cause those guys are moving too. So seems to me anyway. I think looking, so. I think, I think everybody's looking for a house. Everybody's looking for a home. Um, you, you know, like we said before, and, um, I just, Heidelberg's there are certain, right here, there are baby. Certain, uh, the Heidelberg <laughs> is right here. We are you know, softly and tenderly, softly and tenderly. Jesus <laughs> is calling. So I was, uh, I, I came to faith in an SBC, so I can sing softly and tenderly 23 times just as I am. There you go. I've done and, it. And watch them come for and watch them come forward. Play the keys, sister. They're still coming forward. Yeah. Come yeah, on, right. Dion. The bus is a white. Um, but as I was what I was getting around to is I have heard this, and tell me, I want to hear your thoughts. I've heard it said that um that to reformed is three C's. Um co confessional, uh, co uh Calvinistic and um I forget what the third now. I, oh, I can't. Co covenantal? Well, did I say, yeah, confessional, covenantal. Yeah, confessional, covenantal, and Calvinistic. And so, if if that is if if that is how it's broadly defined, and the Baptists would say, well, we do have a covenant theology. It's not exactly the same as yours, but we do have a covenant theology. And again, I'm just I'm I'm saying these are the things yeah. they would say. They would say we sure. do have covenant theology. Um, we do have. Um, we do have our confession, which is obviously very akin to the Westminster. There's, there are certain major distinctions, but we have these, these things and we're Calvinistic. Um, d does that not put us at least in, in a reformed ish category? <laughs> and again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to defend, I'm trying to defend my friends here. Cause again, I don't care. Our church, our church is called sovereign grace family church. Yeah. It's not even, it doesn't even have Baptist in the title. And we hold to the first London confession. We don't even hold to the 1689. Our church holds okay. to the, oh, wow. to the first confession. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Now that's a very interesting document because I'm writing on that right now. So if you look at the Heidelberg, really? Heidelberg.net, yeah, I'm doing a piece. On, well, not exactly on the first London, but I'm working on that in that time period because I'm working on a mm -hmm. getting, leading up to a series uh, on Featley's Dippers Dipped. And so I, uh, part I'm, one very a, I'm very familiar with that. Yeah. <laughs> no, part one is a sort of theological overview that that ran today. Next week will be uh, just an introduction um, to uh, Kiffin, William Kiffin and his background and setting mm -hmm. so that readers will understand. And then uh, the third week I'll do Featley. And then the fourth week I'll start in on the on the actual uh, debate that that went on. So uh, and I've done a, a well. It, surprising amount of writing about 1689 and the development of Baptist history, uh, not academically, but, you know, mostly on the blog a little bit. I did a, a piece in uh, on being reformed or I did some work on Baptist history. But. 
Well, I was going to mention the Featly thing because when, when when we actually our church actually holds the 1646, and the reason why the 44 immediately was responded to. I think it was yeah. Featly when with his dippers yeah. dipped, and there was there were things in the 44 confession that were not explained very well, or they needed yeah. to be updated, or what. So so that so that 1689 is really not the second London Confession. It's the uh, if you want to say it's the third or even third, the fourth, yeah. depending on how you. Well, uh, yeah, because. The 1646 is the addition of the 1644, which was was changed a lot because yeah. of the the response. People read it and said, "This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong." Yeah, yeah. And so, well, and yeah. that's part of what I'm I'm trying to do is to say, um, well, how did the Reformed respond to the particular Baptist movement when they actually met it? And that part of yeah. the story, I don't think, has been fully appreciated. I'm not, my point in the series isn't going to be to defend everything Featley says, but I just want people to uh, get to know uh, and feel a little bit. Um, so for example, the, you know, and um, so I don't, I don't mean anything by this, but the, if you translate the Greek title, right, it's um, kata, uh, katabaptistoi, katapistoi is what the Greek says. Well, he uses catabaptist, not even Anabaptist. So catabaptist is just slight is a, just a little bit more prejudicial, right? Anna is again, and kata is against. So so mm. uh, this is a, this is a word that Zwingli used, Calvin used. It really depended. You can almost measure the temperature of how uh, irate a Reformed guy was in the period by whether they used Anna or kata. If they used kata, they were a little more irritated. Uh, so there's that, and then. The adjective, uh, uh, I guess, uh, substantive catapistoi is onomatopoetic. And so the translation of dippers dipped is actually a little polite. Um, it's, it's, it's okay. It's a very loose paraphrase. It's strictly speaking, it's the opponents of, baptized, uh, of baptism, strictly, uh, sp uh, specifically infant baptism, spat upon because catapistoi is, is onomatopoetic. So it's catapistoi. In other words, the sound you'd make if you were mm. spitting. So it's very interesting. Um, I, in, again, I'm not defending that. I wouldn't speak that way necessarily. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think people have been a little too glib in saying, well, of course we can be reformed um, because you know, R.C. Sproul accepted us or something. Well, okay, fine. R.C. is entitled to his opinion. And I love R.C. I mean, he, I benefited greatly from R.C.'s ministry. Um, but what was the original Reformed response? And it's a, it's a very strongly worded, very heated response. Um, so anyway, it'll be interesting to, to go through that. And I, thank you for telling me about the 1646. I, I know about 44 and then 77 which becomes 89 but i'm not sure i knew about 46 yeah. so thank you i will look into that um, yeah i uh, i actually have a uh, an article i wrote on it i'll send it to you um please do not 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 nothing nothing much but we when our church adopted it we we put it before the congregation and, and our there were things in the 1689 that we did not want to affirm mm -hmm. And we did not want to affirm a document that had to come automatically with asterisks. We didn't want to have yeah, like, yeah. well, we don't affirm this yeah. or we don't affirm this. So sure. we we decided to go with an, uh, a document that we could affirm. And it's only 52 articles, which is great because it provides us one article a week that we can we read did. in corporate work. Yeah. Well, we, we, <laughs> we appreciate that, right? The Heidelbergs in 52 Lord's Day. So um, that's good yeah. pedagogy. So for the three C's, uh, you know, it's true. Uh, well, let's see. The first one was. What confessional, is confessional. Uh, and so, yeah. I, and I've had this conversation where people say, well, we're confessional. And, and I say, well, that's true. You are, but your confession is different. And this is one of the things I, I so in the second piece, I argue a, a little bit with Michael Haken and Tom Nettles who want to align the early particular Baptists with the reformed and sort of paper over some of the differences. And one of the things that I've been learning over the years is that the differences are actually, and, and, the early reform knew this were are, are more profound than than uh, the the sort of dominant narrative now allows, and so you regularly see particular Baptist writers saying, "Well, we're you know we're we're our confession, especially relative to the 1689 or 1677, is almost identical to the Westminster." Well, that's not really true. 
Uh, there's a lot of formal similarities, but there are some pretty significant subterranean and even formal differences. Um, there's a really, uh, a, there's a very different reading of redemptive history. And so my Baptist friends, well, that shouldn't, ma- they say, well, that shouldn't matter. And, and our response is, or my response is, well, it does matter. It matters a lot. You don't get to tell us that it shouldn't matter. That's like, that's like me telling you, well, why are you so sticky about uh, uh, believers only baptism? Why, why is that such a sticking point? Well, you say, well, that's a conviction of mine. This is what the scriptures teach. And we're, we really believe this. And okay, I accept that. Then why can't you accept the fact that we really believe in the continuity of the covenant of grace? You know, one covenant of grace, mm-hmm. multiple administrations. And it's re- that's really, really important to us. And by the way, that debate goes back to the 1520s and 30s. Zwingli was making these arguments in 1527. The arguments that I make in public against the modern Baptist position are the exact same arguments that Zwingli was making against the Anabaptists, or as he called them, Catabaptists, in uh, uh, 1527. So, and again, that's a fact. And my particular Baptist friends say, well, we're not Anabaptists. And I say, well, that's true in some ways, right? You're not Anabaptist in Christology. You're not Anabaptist on the state. Um, and there, are a lot, there are other ways you're not Anabaptist on property, right? I get that. And soteriology, that's really big. The Anabaptists, by and large, had a terrible soteriology. So there's really important ways in which particular Baptists are not Anabaptists. But when it comes to the history of redemption, and uh, church and sacraments, you are Anabaptist in significant ways, which is why when I argue with Baptists politely, there's always this ambivalence. You know, if I critique the Anabaptists, inevitably some Baptists will write to me, it's often a, a, a particular Baptist or 1689er will say, you know, how come you're so mean? And, and I want to say, well, wait, you just told me you're not an Anabaptist. Why are you getting prickly when I criticize the Anabaptists? Well, it's because you have this ambivalent relationship with them. You are indebted to them in important ways. And so, you know, the, the particular Baptist identity is complicated. Yeah, I think it's more complicated than a lot of particular Baptists want to say. Because um, there were general Baptists before there were particular Baptists. And the general Baptists wouldn't have become Baptists without the Dutch Anabaptists when they fled to the Netherlands from England. Um, and I learned that from, from at least a formerly Baptist historian. So it's, you know, history is messy. And, and so my job is to try to help people get to grips with all of it. Um, and, um, you know, so, you know, yeah, even, no, I th- I, go ahead. That's helpful. Very helpful. No, I was just, I was just saying, I think that's very helpful. And, and, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is funny because our confessions, both the, both the, the, the first London and the second London do try to make that separation you know the, the yeah. fact that the the, the confession we hold not first line we are not anabaptists and, and but 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 i think what they were trying to do and again from a historical perspective i think they were trying to distinguish themselves from the radical nature especially the munster rebellion and, and those things that were happening that had brought real fear regarding oh, yeah. the anabaptists fear that, that that this was a radical movement that would create uh, a, you know a, a lawless movement and a dangerous movement people who are unwilling to submit to uh the, 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 the yeah the authorities and everything and so i, I think um it, it, at that point the the distinction is not we don't believe in the same view of baptism the distinction is we don't behave like them <laughs> like like they like we have a different view and and like you said other theological distinctions as well i mean and so that's right i mean it's a it was a rhetorical move but it was all it was always only partly true and and so but it's become like an identifying uh Mark, you know, when I have this conversation, Baptists will say, but I'm not Anabaptist. Well, yes and no. You are in certain ways and you aren't. You, and I always try to say, you know, the ways in which modern particular Baptists or, you know, confessional particular Baptists, whether 1644, 46, you know, 77, 89, whatever it may be, I, uh, you know, they are not Anabaptists in really important ways. And those are the ways that where we have real communion. And I recognize that. You know, so I want people to know I worship in a particular Baptist congregation regularly, not here in town, but when I'm on the road, when I go back home, uh, you know, my dear friend, Pat uh, Abendroth, 
uh, always manages to have a believer's baptism every time I'm there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he says he has yet to get me in the splash zone. We tend to sit in the back, uh, you know, the sort of. Uh, but the people are very kind and gracious, and and uh, I love them, and they they've really accepted and received us. So I want people to know this isn't personal. Uh, I don't have any animus. I've taught lots of, of particular Baptist students. I recommend, uh, you know, particular Baptist congregations, uh, you know, because the, the reform movement is small and they're, you know, but in the in the plains where I'm from, right after you after you go west of Kearney, there are no Napark Park churches in Nebraska. And if you're in the Sandhills, I have dear friends who live in the Sandhills, they are four hours from any Nay Park Church, North American Presbyterian and Reform Council, OPC, URC, PCA, and, and those churches. There aren't any. Um, so, you know, we, we have to make friends in a, in a variety of places, just as a, a matter of spiritual survival. So you think, you, based on what you're saying, what it sounds like, you would say, like a church, a Baptist calling himself particular Baptist, that that's perfectly Go for fine. It. That, that's, that, the, that's, that's 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 a historic. Yeah, that's your heritage. Yeah. You are, and you you are confessional. You're not. It's not a reformed confession as we understand it. Um, you know, you're covenantal. That's right. But there have been a lot of covenant theologies, and yours is one of them. It's mm -hmm. not ours, but it is one. Um, and Calvinistic. Well, you're you're predestinarian. And you, I think you agree with Calvin in, you know, justification, sanctification, and those are all really important. I mean, really, really important. Um, so, amen. Sure. But I, I always, you know, hesitate to rem or try to remind people um, that no Baptist could have, e even in the 1640s, could have gone to Geneva and said, right, which is the home of Calvinism, and said, you know, can, can we come to the Lord's table? And, you know, I, you know, uh, um, Kiffin, William Kiffin, was among the leaders in in, in condemning, criticizing uh, Bunyan for admitting those who only had baby baptism to communion, because they were convinced that unless you had a believer's baptism, you were not actually baptized. And they said only baptized people can, can come to communion. And you know, in principle, I agree with that. That only baptized people, we just define baptism differently. Um, you know, um, so I'm all for, you know, so what I say to my, my Baptist friends is I want to make Baptist great again, right? It's not as, not as sexy as MAGA, but I, you know, uh, what is it? M B <laughs> M B G A. Yeah. No, I don't know how to pronounce yeah. that. It sounds yeah. like it may be an, an, like an African surname or something, but, um, I, <laughs> uh, that's what I'm that's trying funny. to do. So it, uh, it, it but but I think I have real fellowship with my confessional, particular Baptist friends who are doing good work on the doctrine of God, um, you know, standing up for uh, uh, the you know ecumenical uh, Christology, you know, rejecting eternal subordination. Matt Barrett and Rich Barcelos, you know, Rich did a nice little book on the Lord's Supper. Um, I've, I've been, uh, Rich, uh, helped me on the Trinity one time. I said something about, uh, three centers of self-consciousness and he rebuked me and he was exactly right about that. I appreciate that very much. He actually helped me from making a, a fairly serious mistake. Um, so uh, actually wandering into heresy that, is what he It's interesting. That leads me to something else. And, 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 and I, I do want to be conscious of your time and I don't want to take you, take you away from anything else or anything. I, I know, you know, uh, I, I, I could, I could talk to you for hours, but um, as you mentioned about the EFS thing, the, or I guess now it's called ERAS, right? Eternal relations of authority and submission. And that's the, the question. There's like three versions. All those so names. ESS, yeah. EFS, ERAS. So I, anyway, yeah. Yeah. So um, that that brings me to a question. Another name that popped in when I said, hey, what is what's something you want us to talk about? One that popped up a few times was Thomism. <laughs> it was St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, wh what's your what's your connection to that? Because I didn't know when 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 people posted that, like, hey, ask him about this. I didn't know where you stood on that and uh, was curious, just like 
you know, you don't have to give me a, you know, a dissertation or anything, but why would they mention you in regard to that? Is that regarding your Trinitarian question or is that, is that? No, I think that's something that else. Be? I did a, I did a piece for Credo on how my mind has changed uh, regarding Thomas. And so that might maybe okay. people are reflecting on that somehow. Did it change in a positive or a negative? Was it was it related to all the stuff? Because I know in the reform ah, reform Baptist, I got to be careful. Ah, you got to <laughs> reach through the screen at me. No, in the in the in the Baptist circles in which I frequent, <laughs> those which would identify themselves as particular and or reformed. Uh, <laughs> I'm absolved. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, the, the, there's a big, or at least, la, you know, within the last two years, there's been a, a lot of arguments and, and, and issues over those who would identify themselves as Thomistic and those who wouldn't. Um, I know James White's been a part of that. He's a friend of mine. I've, I've had conversations with him about it. I've had other, uh, other people who have brought other issues in. I know, um, things like, uh, eternal, um, uh, not only eternal subordinationism, but also the issue of divine simplicity and impassibility. These are these are questions that seem to revolve around the Thomistic question. So when you say you your mind sort of changed, was it positive, negative? What were and, well, and some people I might have just left part of the audience like, what is he talking about? But I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I do. Well, no. Uh, so things like divine simplicity that's just ecumenical Christianity. So anybody who denies that God is one is not an ecumenical mm. Christian. That person is a heretic. So that has nothing to do with Thomas. Um, you know, anybody who didn't, anybody who says the son is eternally subordinate to the father is, um, you know, that's a highly problematic thing to say. I want to be careful of what I say, because I don't know of any ecclesiastical body that's condemned that. But if I had my druthers, uh, our synod would condemn uh, you know that uh, that doctrine that uh, that the son is eternally subordinate to the father. I think that is outside the bounds of ecumenical orthodoxy, and it's the fruit of people uh, like Wayne Grudem and others who are reading the Bible without taking due account of the history of doctrine and the ecumenical creeds. So the short way of putting it, it's the fruit of biblicism. And uh, biblicism always leads to this kind of stuff. Again, that this has that has nothing to do with Thomas. That's just ecumenical Christianity. So my, you know, I did the piece on Thomas because I teach medieval history and I lecture on Thomas mm. and I do a seminars with students. You know, I, I, we do a medieval seminar. We have a degree in historical theology, so our students read patristics and medieval and Reformation, post Reformation and modern. And in their medieval seminar, which I teach, we read Thomas. And so reading Thomas over the last 26, 27 years has changed my mind. And um, uh, I don't see him the way that I did. You know, I was taught as a young Reformed guy to think of Thomas as the enemy and Thomas as a source mm. of evil and corruption. And and um, as I read him more and more, I began to see, well, no, Thomas is, I disagree with Thomas about some fairly important things, but he's a Christian and uh, he's trying to help me understand the faith. He's trying to help me to understand the scriptures and um, he has some things to teach me. And uh, uh, so I, I've learned uh, quite a bit. I don't know that I would call myself a Thomist, um, but I but I appreciate Thomas, and I don't see him as an enemy anymore. And I think there's a certain strain of fundamentalists out there, both Pado Baptist and Baptist, who don't know Thomas and have been taught uh, directly or indirectly to think of him as a kind of an, a, a, a source of error and corruption and a and a you know, as they would have said in the old days, an accursed seducer, right? And that's just wrong. It's um, it, it's a misreading of Thomas, it, and I'm I'm happy to say it's it's ignorance of Thomas. You can't actually sit down and read Thomas for yourself and come away with the with that view of Thomas. And so there's a lot of fearful, I think, fundamentalist ignorance of Thomas. Um, both in, in, in uh, you know, I'm pretty confident it exists in Baptist circles, but I know it exists in my circles. Um, you would never get the impression mm. from reading uh, Francis Schaeffer that Thomas was a beneficial part of our tradition, the, the broader Christian tradition. And frankly, you wouldn't get the sense from Van Til uh, that would be, you know, I think I have a friend who's arguing to me that Van Til really didn't know Thomas. He really knew 
a neo Thomism from the 19th century. And that seems likely given Van Til's education. And, um, you know, Scott Oliphant recently did a book that was panned by people who actually know Thomas um, as a really very mm. poor. I, I'm glad it exists because I hold it up and I tell my students, this is exactly the kind of work I don't want you to do. Right. So if you want to know what mm. not to do in terms of historical method, using reading sources, et cetera, this is this is the kind of work I don't want you to do. So I want you to do the opposite. I want you to read uh, sources in context. I want you to read them sympathetic, sympathetically, carefully, um, and, and so forth. And, you know, the reviews, I'm not saying anything that, uh, you know, the reviewers haven't already said. You know, read read Mueller's review of, of that book. So, but there's a lot of people out there who've been taught that sort of hostile view of Thomas. So I, I suspect that's what that's about. Mm, okay. Uh, you mentioned Van Til just... Uh, where was where did Van Til teach? I I, I should know this, but uh, he, it, w it was he taught from 1929 or thereabouts, very early on in the history of Westminster Seminary, Philadelphia, until his retirement okay, from Philadelphia. Okay, in in Philadelphia. Um, so I think he retired in the mid to late 70s, if memory serves. Okay, and you're in you're you teach at Westminster, California. That's that's right. We are, we were daughtered by Philadelphia in 1980. Gotcha. So, and this is like a way departure, but just because you mentioned Van Til, it just brought in a question in my mind. Are you personally more presuppositional when it comes to your apologetic? You're more classical? Where, where do you land on that particular question? And I know that's a far afield question from everything we've talked about, but it just, Van Til struck a, struck a chord with my question box. So I just want to Wanted to wanted to throw that out there, where, 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 and and maybe I should know that, but I, I just don't know where where you are on that. You're breaking up really badly for me, and I only heard parts of that. I think you were asking about apologetic method, classical presuppositional, and all that. Was that what you were asking? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. I, I'm a Vantillian still. I mean, I have some criticisms of Van Til now. This you know, at late stage in my career. I appreciate Van Til a lot. He helped me a great deal. And I still think as a matter of apologetics, he's essentially correct. Um, so I'm, I'm with Van Til, but I, I probably have more trouble with the Van Tillians uh, because I don't think a lot of them are all that faithful to what Van Til was actually about. I, I strongly recommend, if you want to get to know Van Til, you know, obviously read Van Til, uh, you know, add Fontes. But uh, if you want a, an introduction Read John Meather's uh, biography of Van Til. That's the single best introduction to Van Til. Um, I, I'm not satisfied with with a lot of the you know introductions to Van Til because they, I think, in some ways they remake him in in their own image. And what I love about um, uh, what John did is that he lets Van Til be what he was, an immigrant, a Dutchman. Um, who ended up in a Presbyterian world, and he was kind of a fish out of water, and um, a guy who in some ways was never entirely comfortable with English. And if you've read Van Til, you know that's true, <laughs> that uh, he, English just wasn't his, uh, you know, in, in a sense, his native language. He never became a very fluid, fluent writer of English. Um, so he's, he's very difficult to understand in that. He can be in that regard. Plus, he's a, you know, he was trained in uh, philosophical idealism in the 19th century. Um, he's an amillennialist, you know, and um, so he's a complicated guy. He's deeply influenced by Gerhardus Voss, who was a great biblical theologian at Princeton uh, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, uh, influenced by Bavink and uh, the neo kyperian movement. And I think we've sort of developed over the years a sort of truncated picture of Van Til. Um, so I'm uh, anyway, so J uh, John Meather's biography of Van Til is a great intro to Van Til. So I, I have a lot of affection for Van Til. I have criticisms. He said some things that were not helpful. Saying that God is one person and three persons was distinctly unhelpful and not to be repeated. I tell my students, if you say that on the floor of classes, I will charge you, right? I've filed charges against you if you say <laughs> that. Uh, in your ecclesiastical <laughs> assemblies. Uh, if you teach that, I will charge you because um, it's contrary to the word of God as we confess it. Um, and, and Van Til should have been, that should have been tested in the courts of the churches. Um, 
you know, but uh, at any rate, it wasn't, and certainly not something to be defended now. I know people are doing that, but it's, it's a mistake, right? All our heroes have clay feet. And uh, that, that's part of what Amen. I try to do as a historian is to make these people human as, as best I can. Well, that's a good thought. Uh, and, and I love that quote. Um, all our heroes have clay feet. That's, that's great. So am I, am I coming through clear again? Are you good yes. hearing me? Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, uh, it, it, if I could have you for just a couple more minutes, I know we're over sure. the hour mark now. And if you need to go, we can we can cut off. But I, I have one final thing I want to bring up, and hopefully it won't take another hour. But no, that's fine. <laughs> it is a pretty a whole, big question. There was a whole raft of of stuff that showed up on Twitter too, so you can pitch those, and I'll hit them quickly. Okay. But go. Um, well, one the, the question, and this is again like the Reformed Baptist question. This is obviously intended yeah. to be somewhat. Uh, uh, you know, pointed. The question is, yeah. why do you want pagans to rule us? That's the question. And I know <laughs> that's the, the that's the theonomy question. Why do you want yeah, pagans exactly. to rule us? Uh, what's your, uh, well, what's your thoughts? What, what's your issue with theonomy? So, um, yeah, hang on a second. We're all right. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. We were breaking up a little bit. Um, I, I don't, uh, but I, I, but I'm not a theocrat and I'm not a theonomist. Theonomy is a Baptist, Anabaptist mistake from the early 16th century, and the Reformed rejected it. Um, you know, uh, lately some people have been poking at me and said, what about Cartwright? Uh, I, I've seen that allegation, and I've seen some evidence that, that Cartwright, who's a 16th century Presbyterian, was a theonomist. He could have been, and if he was, he was wrong. You know, I'm not a tribalist. Greg Bonson was a Presbyterian, and he was flat wrong. Um, there's almost nothing right about theonomy and Christian ethics. It's a series of fundamental mistakes, exegetical mistakes, theological mistakes, historical mistakes, ca categorical mistakes. Um, you know, but our guys, uh, when they confronted theonomy in the person of Karlstadt, rejected it soundly as uh, contrary to the, their understanding of the Word of God. Uh, the, the, most, the judicial laws expired with the state of that people. And then uh, the theonomist said, well, well, general equity. Yes, uh, general, we should salute general equity every time he comes by. <laughs> um, that's a, I say, that's a joke, son. <laughs> so, general, <laughs> general equity is a beautiful thing. And it's just code for natural law. If we, if people would just read, I, I, go ahead. If, if I, I'm so glad you said that because when somebody asked me to explain general equity, I said basically what you just said, that there is a law that demonstrates God's moral nature or his that, that his that his 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 righteousness and 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 it's and it's demonstrated to us in in the Decalogue and 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 we see it throughout the Old and New Testaments of God's moral nature. And this is the this is the law that should be upheld by all men. That 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 things like thieving, stealing, and, and murder, and these things are, are naturally wrong. So when you mention natural law, I'm assuming we're talking in very similar terms there. Well, I mean, Nero knew that theft was wrong. Nero didn't know the Old Testament from a hole in the ground, but he knew that murder, he knew that murder was wrong. He knew that theft was wrong. He didn't need the special revelation to know those things. And Calvin you know, wrote about, I learned my doctrine of natural law from John Calvin, that liberal who distinguished between uh, the two spheres over which God rules, right, that he's ordained in life, essentially the sacred and the secular, the temporal and the eternal is what he says. God has a, a twofold government, um, he says. And he thought, he expected the magistrate <clears throat> to be able to look at natural law and determine, um, you know, uh, what crimes should be punished and how they should be punished. Um, Johannes Wallabius said, he, he was a, a Swiss theologian in the early 17th century, uh, he said that the, you know, the Old Testament judicial laws are only binding today insofar as they agree with natural law, things that can be known from nature. So that's traditional reform theology. And the theonomists are basically Anabaptist radicals with an over-realized eschatology trying to redefine reform theology in their own image. And uh, they don't like me because I won't let them do it. Um, 
uh, I've, I've been dealing with the theonomists literally now, this is 44 years uh, or so, 43 years. I met my first theonomist in 1980 or 81. And I've been talking to them and listening, reading ever, ever since. Um, and it's, um, it's a sectarian fundamentalist ideology. It's not a reformed ideology. It's a cul-de-sac. It's a, a, a toll booth through which people pass, unfortunately, to get into the reformed world. What do you think is going to happen um, regarding the, the, the rise in, in theonomic thought right now? I mean, do you, do you have any, I know you're not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but do you have any, any, any words of warning or concern about what you think might be coming oh, down I, the pike with, with I, theonomy and all that? Well, you know, the, so Christian nationalism is just the new face of theonomy. Now, that's a broad statement, and I think there are forms of Christian nationalism that are not theonomic. But, uh, you know, for example, if you look at um, uh, Stephen Wolf's book, there's a lot in that book that should be very concerning to any American who, you know, understands the founding, understands the, you know, the intent of the founders, the language of the Constitution. Um, you know, Baptists, there are a lot of Baptists who are solidly behind him. Uh, including, you know, William Wolfe, but, uh, all, you know, and the new organization that Wolfe is directing and Tom Askell's on the board. And, uh, you, you know, it's very strange to see Baptists, uh, you know, supporting uh, theocracy and, and quasi-theonomic ideas and a Christian prince who has the authority to punish heretics. Uh, it makes me wonder if Baptists know their own history. I, do I have to teach Baptists their own history? What happens? When you when you get no, I, I, that kind of authority, I, I want to say something about what you just said because, quite frankly, um, someone posted this, and I, I'm not going to mention any names or anything because I'm not looking to get in any fights. But someone posted a picture of um, a Baptist. It was a painting of a Baptist having his fa his face shoved under the water. And it was be it was it was after. I mean, we know this happened. We know there were Baptists sure. who were drowned for, for baptism. And I have, I have said, I, and, and when, and when they posted, they posted it as it was, as if it were humorous, yeah. like this is a joke. I said, this is not a joke to me because that man represents yeah. my theological heritage. That man, that man is to me, my spiritual ancestor. And, 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 and so I do have concerns in that regard to where, uh, it, who is going to be the one determining who the heretics are, who's going to be the well, one determining exactly. who gets ground. You know, doesn't anybody yeah. know the history of Christendom? Um, you know, does anybody know the the bloody history of religious warfare in the 16th century the, and all through the 17th century leading up to the 18th century? The founders were not stupid. They knew what they were doing. And we have managed to have a country, uh, you know, as, as crazy and loony as things are. And, you know, just look out the window. You, you know, I don't have to persuade anybody that if you don't think things are loony, then you're not paying attention. But, uh, you know, rejecting the founding is not the, the way forward. Uh, that's the way backwards. That's a, and again, that's, that's the product of a Baptist over-realized eschatology and, a, and a, a refusal to get to grips with nature. You know, one, I, you know, Baptists have always had trouble with, with distinguishing nature and grace. Nature is one thing, grace is something else. Grace does not wipe out nature. We had this argument with the Anabaptists, the Reform did, in the 17th century, and we quoted Thomas Aquinas, grace does not destroy nature, it perfects it. And so when I see Reformed Orthodox people citing Thomas against the Anabaptists, and by the way, against the Baptists, um, because they didn't distinguish, right? It's just for, you really, you, they use the same language for both groups. Uh, uh, it tells me that they identified in, in the Baptist movement an over-realized an eschatology, a desire for too much heaven now. Um, and uh, mm. so that's, that's what's behind, I think, what is behind this. People are scared. They want to fix. They don't want to take the time to be citizens to do the things that need to be done. I tell people, popple, pray, organize, persuade, uh, legislate, litigate, popple, right? Persuade, organize, uh, pray, organize, persuade, legislate, litigate. Those are the things that citizens do. 
And uh, we haven't even really begun doing that. And people want to give up on the on the founding and uh, hire some um, Christian prince to take care of our problems for us. Um, that's crazy. Doesn't anybody read the Bible? What what did what did the prophet say? You want a king? This is what's going to happen. He's going to take all your stuff. And people said, "Yeah, we want a king. We want him to take all our stuff." No, it's just dumb. I'm sorry. It's just dumb. Do you think that there is anything wrong with a a person, a Christian, that would say to the leaders in the government, "You are wrong, and you need to repent"? That that's a that's a thought that kind of comes oh, to my no. mind because while absolutely while, we should say yeah, that, right? Absolutely, yeah. We I mean, say so. That. so Christians, Christians should engage the government. We should speak our mind. We should defend our civil liberties. Uh, when people do wicked things, we should tell them, listen, what you're doing is wicked and you need to stop. You know, that, um, that, that, that's Christian citizenship. What you're doing is against nature, right? Uh, when you're promoting the trans ideology, that's against nature. Uh, you're promoting uh, gay marriage, that's against nature. Um, you're letting criminals go free. That's against the nature of the function of the magistrate. You're, you're not uh, putting murderers to death. That's against nature. We we should say all those things. Um, you know, so people assume that because I'm not a theocrat or a Christian nationalist, I must be some kind of leftist. And that's just not true. Um, if you put me in charge, um, right, I would clean I would clean up the streets very quickly. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. A, a, a few months ago, because I'm pretty well known as an amillennialist, only because eschatology Amen. matters, you know, the whole king of the amillennial, you know, joke. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, and uh, but I was preaching and I posted a I posted a, a clip of my my sermon, which I often do. And in the sermon, I was talking about the 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 need for the government to repent the need for the, the what you just said they're, they're violating God's natural law they're violating the 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 very the very does not the very nature of things show you these things are sinful the things that you're doing yes. and somebody said you sound like a post millennialist you need to become a post millennialist I was like no as an amillennialist I can still say those things I can still stand and say yes if if you are promoting abortion that needs to end. If you're promoting homosexuality, yeah. that needs to end. If you're promoting those things which go against the very nature of God and who he is and how he created us in his image, that you need to repent. And I, I don't think I have to be a post-millennialist to say those things. And that's why no, you, I'm glad. Yeah, glad you we certainly agree. don't. You certainly don't. And, you know, uh, now when Paul spoke to the magistrate, people have said to me, well, Paul spoke to the magistrate as if Paul was making policy prescriptions. Well, uh, go look and see what Paul actually said when he spoke to the magistrate. He called those people to repent and to believe in Jesus, right? Now, That's right. I think Christians should be good citizens, and I, I've, I've just given you, right, the, the five things I think Christians should be doing to try to be of use to their fellow citizens. Uh, but we have to, I think, learn to participate in society without being in charge. And I'm not saying, you know, we should run, we should serve, you know, all of those things. But the idea seems to be, a lot of Christians seem to have the idea that, well, we can't participate in society because it's dirty and uh, unless we're in charge. Um, and, and I just think that uh, betrays, a, a, again, a bad eschatology. You're an amillennial, so am I. And that tells me that we live in a fallen world. It's going to be difficult at times, and it's going to be a fallen world. There's not going to be an earthly glory age before Jesus returns. And a lot of American Christians are really looking forward to an earthly glory age, um, you know, one way or another, whether they're Kiliasts, premillennialists, or postmillennialists, they're looking for an earthly glory age. And, um, you know, that's you, you just can't justify an earthly glory age before Jesus returns. You can't. It's not, and postmillennialists really don't try very seriously. It's pretty half hearted. This is something they know really before they ever get to Scripture. And uh, they spent a lot of time explaining why the passages that that contradict them. Well, that was fulfilled in AD seventy. That's not really for today. Uh, well, then what about uh, Jesus, who said, you know, um, you know, if they slap you, turn the other cheek. Well, that's that was for then, but that's not for now, or not when we're in charge. And they start becoming functional dispensationalists. 
right? Pretty radical dispensationalists. Big chunks of the Bible really don't apply. Well, what about First Peter that says you're blessed when you suffer? Well, that's for them, but not when we're in charge. You know, they, you know pretty soon you get the sense this isn't really a, a, an ethos and eschatology uh, that is driven by Scripture. This, this is driven by something else, I think. Hmm. Well, brother, I want to just, first of all, I'm, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I, I, I'm thankful. I have a thousand other questions, but we, you know, we're moving in on, we're, we're getting close to an hour and a half and, and, okay. and I, I don't want to, I don't want to keep you, but I do. I have one last question. This one should be easy to answer. And I think it would be a very, very good way to end. One of the people on Twitter asked, when is your two volume set on the Heidelberg confession? coming out or the Heidelberg catechism, I, I guess, I don't know, which is it, is it, is it, uh, it's a catechism. When, when is your two volume set? Okay. When is your two volume set coming out? I don't know. It's at the publishers. And you know, once you send it off to the publishers, it's, you know, who knows? Uh, I got the sense from one conversation that they hope maybe to have the electronic version by the end of the year. Um, but mm -hmm. what will, you know, how soon the print version will be, I haven't had any proofs or anything come back. So, you know, I have other things I'm working on. And, um, uh, in fact, I, I'm, I'm in the middle of doing another book right now and, um, it's coming together actually nicely. I'm about in terms of the very first rough draft, I'm, I'm just about four fifths of the rough draft done. So that will, that book will probably be out before the commentary. <laughs> it's a big work. It's a technical okay. work. There's a lot of stuff that has to be done to get it right. But it's a uh, Lexham is a very good publisher, They're very professional, they'll do a good job. And when it's out, then it will be a, a I hope, a, a book that will be useful and, and um, not one, you know, that's full of mistakes and things. So Amen. that's the hope. Amen. What what do you feel like in this last thing? What do you feel like in your, in that set? What do you feel like is your, your, your best contribution to the history of this, of this catechism and, and what it means to the Christian church? What, what do you, what do you feel? What are you most yeah. proud of? Um, you know, um, the, well, <laughs> again, so this goes back to the publisher. The original title was guilt, grace, and gratitude. Um, a, a theological, historical, pastoral commentary on the Heidelberg catechism. So I, and then they said, well, we, we don't want to use those words, guilt, grace, and gratitude. So what do I know? Um, they're just using the subtitle. Um, well, they're the experts, so I, I defer to them. But um, I, I think my big contribution is to help people to understand that there are three parts to the Heidelberg Catechism. And I, you know, when I taught at Wheaton and whenever I, wherever I get a chance to teach, I always say there are three parts to the Christian faith, guilt, grace, and gratitude. And if you get that, mm. guilt is law, grace is gospel, Gratitude flows out of the gospel. And if you get that basic structure of the Christian life, the book of Romans, the Heidelberg Catechism, um, it's really transformational. I love that. And I I am now going to steal that and I'm going to put that <laughs> into, well, into practice because I do. think that's great. It's not original with me. That's, uh, you know, this is the, the um, uh, second question of the, uh, second or third question. I don't know. I got to get this right. I'm going to get in trouble. You wrote a commentary. And you don't even know. Uh, let me think. Yeah. Second <laughs> question. How, how many things are necessary for you to know that in this comfort, you may live and die happily? Three things. First, the greatness of my sin and misery. Second, how I am redeemed from all my sins and misery. And third, how I am to be thankful to God for such redemption. Um, so that's, that's, we call that basic reformed Christianity. And I, so I, in that commentary, I tried to uh, bring Ursinus and Olivianus and some of the early Reformed writers back into the conversation to help us understand the Catechism in its original context. So I spent a lot of time, uh, particularly in the last part of the commentary, because by that time, you know, Olivianus's commentaries sort of end at a certain point, but Ursinus went all the way through his lectures. And so I ended up working uh, closely with the Latin text of Ursinus to try to really get to grips with what he was doing. And I tried to really mine that and make use of it and integrate it into the commentary. So I think that's a contribution that when you're, I hope when you're reading this commentary, you'll get a sense that you're learning to read the commentary the way it was originally intended to be understood by the original framers, authors, editors, uh, rather than 
you know, there are lots of Reformed collections of sermons. So in our tradition, we preach sermons that are somehow related to the Catechism on Sunday night. And there are lots of those that have been collected and published. But we haven't had, uh, other than one uh, that was done um, 15, 20 years ago, we haven't had a, a sort of historical academic commentary on the Catechism for a long time. So I tried to, you know, uh, make her sign us great again, I guess. Well, that, that sounds wonderful. I look forward to it when it comes out. Look forward to uh, what it's going to mean uh, in, in, the, in the sense of uh, helping people to understand the catechism. And just what you just said has helped me tonight. So I want to thank you again for being a part of the show and being willing to come on and, 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 and just banter about theology. Boy, I could do this all night. <laughs> so thank you. Th thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me, Keith, and thank you for putting up with me. I, I appreciate it. You've been a kind, gracious, and gentle host, and you were nice. Oh uh, well. <laughs> well, that's that. I have to be. The song says so. so <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, well, thank you, brother. And I want to thank you guys for being a part of the show today. Again, so grateful to have Dr. Clark come on and so grateful to have you as the audience. Remember, if you have any questions or you have someone you'd like for me to interview in the future, you can reach me at keithfosky.com. Thank you for being a part of your Calvinist podcast. My name is Keith Foskey, and as always, I've been your Calvinist. May God bless you.